feeling good. I'm like, yes. Okay, Jens, we, we count on you. We just go full gas up this climb. And I knew on top, I have Fabian Cancellaro waiting for me. So I could go more or less full gas because I knew I have a very strong teammate waiting on top to help me. Yes. And yeah, I managed to okay, basically drop everybody apart from 25 other riders. And I talk. Then I saw Fabian on top. Yeah, Fabian Cancellaro waiting. He's a great descender. He took the descent from the front. I followed his wheel. We went full gas to the valley. And in the end, we ended up so taking the so what was the ride that you think put Jens Voigt on the, on the map? Which was the first ride that actually said, well, actually Jens Voigt uh, is going somewhere in this sport? Good question. I mean, as I said, I was the first time I was racing in Australia in 1994. And with the winning the Commons Bank Classic, and the points I got for that, I won the Amateur World Cup. So I knew I was going to try to become professional already then. Um, but maybe my first win as a pro in the 98 tour of the bus country. Um, like a bad, rainy, terrible day. I was in a break, managed to drop the others, win the stage, and maybe there my team or myself realized, okay, he has a certain potential to become a good rider. Your biggest day on the bike? The, most, the day you look back and say, well, that was my day. That was, well, not your day, but the team's day. The, the biggest win of the team's career that you were involved in. Probably a team time trial in Tour de France 19... No. 99? No, 2001. 2001, I'm sorry, 2001. We had Stuart of Radiant Yellow Jersey. And that's when we started the team time trial as the last team. And we did get all the split times from the other teams. We ended up winning the team time trial. And the team time trial is everybody's happy to win. It's like a, we won it. Us. If an individual rider wins, it's great. But it's the one rider winning. The team time trial, everybody's happy. The whole team feels like I was part of this. That's what makes it so magic. Plus, we did beat some pretty good teams back then. You've been involved in some uh, some pretty uh, big wins for other bike riders. Stewie O'Grady, uh, Ken Solaro, who you've already mentioned. Uh, what, what What is the satisfaction for you with regard to, to working for these guys, the guys that do win the bike races? Well, the way I see it, um, I like to talk in metaphors because it makes things easier to explain. So in an ideal scenario, your career is like a circle, like a closed circle. You get in on the bottom end of the circle and you all let people help you, give you advice. On the top end of the circle, you want to perform. You say, hey, I want to win this race. I want to have this special bike. I want to have the team behind me. And then when the circle closes on the bottom end again, your mind still knows how to win, but your body cannot win anymore. That's your moment to give back to the team. And in an ideal scenario, or in the ideal world, it's perfectly balanced between taking and giving throughout your career. So I had my days in the sunlight. I had my days as a leader, but I also had my days where I just put the head down and killed myself or somebody else. And I feel it's, it's pretty balanced in my career. 18 years as a professional, that's a fairly extended career. What do you put down to your longevity within the sport and, and the, the maintaining the desire to race and turn up every year? Well, you want to have the correct answer or you want to have the truth? <laughs> Give us the truth. We'll the truth is, I'm people. married with six children <laughs> and my mother-in-law lives in the house. So that keeps you going. Well, you have six kids. So yes, I have uh, six yeah, kids. That, that also takes and the mother in the house living there, yeah, the mother-in-law. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, I just loved what I did. I was in a lucky position that I discovered what I'm good at and I liked it and I could turn it into my job. I mean, you know, my office was being out there in the fresh air listening to the birds singing and keeping my body healthy and strong. That was my office. That was my job. So it doesn't get much better. So the Tour Down Under. Seeing we're here at the Tour Down Under and uh, it's one of cycling's, uh, Australia cycling's icons and, and one of the World Tour races. Uh, did you ride the first, very first TDU? Uh, not the very first one, but already the second one. The second one. So I have seen how it's kept getting bigger and better every year. And I have done 
And now we have the 18s. I probably have done 14 of them as a bike rider and now two as ambassador. So it's that good you still keep turning up, so... Oh, absolutely. I love <laughs> it here. There must be a reason why I come back. And so your best memory from the tour? Best memory is going to be clearly in the last year or second last year of my career going up the longer hill and as we already talked about it in the last year of my career I was a helper, I was a domestic. So my job was done on the bottom of the Bilonga hill to get my knee nice. to, the to the climb and then I was getting dropped. As I'm riding along, trying to see some energy for the next days, there's a spectator or a group of spectators, young men, running next to me and go, Yanzi, come on! And he had a beer in the hand. I said, Yanzi, share a beer! And I grabbed the beer from the spectator, had a zip of the beer, passed it back to him. That was my favorite moment. Having a beer with a spectator in the middle of the race. What makes the, the tour down under, it, it, is, it is different from every other tour that you would actually go to throughout the world. Hammer time! What makes the tour down under special? You know, why do the riders want to keep coming nice. back? Nice! It's, it's the whole setup. That you stay the whole week in one hotel, very short, or next to no transfers. Um, it's a great feeling of, of, it's the warm welcome of the people. You could see at this race, people of South Australia, people of Melbourne, uh, of Adelaide, I meant, happy and proud to have it here. Um, so you, you see the support of the whole community behind it, that they're happy to have that race here. And that's always a good feeling. And I mean, there's a lot of worse places in the world where you could start your season. You know, we are lucky. And the coffee's good? The, the coffee is good? Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so th this is most important, I think. Yeah, it is. Uh, to me, at least, it is. Do, they, do you think this can be replicated anywhere else in the world? Do you think that, uh, do you think that this sort of tour is, is exceptional and maybe should be replicated? It it's exceptional because, as I said, the whole setup. Do you have the same hotel, short or no transfers? You can go flat direction Glen Elk, you can go into some pretty pretty tough, pretty tough climbing in the Adelaide Hills. You got the Barossa Valley, you got beautiful places. Um, so it's all right here. You, don't, you cannot duplicate that anywhere else. Okay, let's talk about the Australian riders, the teammates that you've had that have been Australian. Uh, and the, the guys that you see, the, the cyclists you see in the, uh, in the peloton, did the Aussies bring a different flavour to the peloton? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, remember, wherever you're from in Australia, if it's Perth, Sydney or Adelaide, if you come to a European team, the closest way home is 30,000 miles. So it's not that you can go, hey, daddy, I feel homesick. Can you come and... No. You've got to be tough. You've got to be a pretty tough cookie to make it in Europe. So for a, a cyclist to, to make it to a pro team, they're, they're halfway there because they, the, the directors, the team owners already know that they're there. They're ready to race. They're ready to go. Yeah, I mean, everybody who signs up in Australia, he knows he gets a tough one and he knows he gets a hungry one. Because in order to come from Australia to Europe, you not only got to have ta talent, you got to be hungry, you got to be wanting it, you got to be... I want to be there, I want to do it. So you can't go wrong with signing up an Australian. And there's more and more Australian riders actually making it into the peloton uh, through the AIS program, but also uh, there's bike riders that make it without the AIS program. So uh, cycling is getting stronger in Australia and being able to provide the numbers within the teams. This is a good thing for Australia. Well, yeah, I mean, the first generation, Hank Fogels, Bobby McHugh and Jordan Grady, or even before Phil Anderson, mm. they paved the way for the next generation to come. And now there's so much talent. I mean, Jack Bobridge, you know, Cameron Meyer, Dennis Rohan, or Rohan Dennis, um, Richie Port, there's so much talent out there that it's very likely that within the next whatever, five or 10 years, another Australian gonna win the Tour de France. 
to follow up Cadell. Who's, who's the next obvious one, do you think? Juan Dennis looks very promising. And Richie, of course. Them two, I think he got the best chance in the moment. Richie, Richie is in an interesting situation, though, with TJ Van Gatteren. Do you think that's, uh, that, that's a problem that might, might uh, put its head up on the road? Well, in the end, the legs will do the talking. It doesn't need to be big magic. He just needs to smash him. He just needs to win a race or needs to show enough potential in the Dauphin Ibarre or in Pyrenees or in the Tour de Swiss. And if Richie wins Tour de Swiss and TG finishes 12, then packing order is pretty clear. We just need to be strong. So tell me, you left home in, uh, what was the temperature when you left home? Sorry? When you left Germany, what um, was the temperature? When I left it was about zero, maybe minus one. Maybe that's warm for but Germany. Yeah, we had a relatively <laughs> mild winter, but now it's minus five, minus ten, and snow. So I left right in time. So and you come out and it's nearly 40 degrees. How, how do you go adjusting? How do you think the riders cope with that process of of minus to 40 degrees. Well, the riders are here more days than me because they got to adapt their bodies. So for me, I don't have to race. And if it's too hot, I just go back to the hotel in the air condition. The riders don't have that option. That's why they come a week or 10 days early to prepare. Okay, back to the TDU. What, uh, where do you think the tour is going to be won this year? Every day is important, of course, but three key moments. Corkscrew, you cannot win a tour there, but you can very easily lose it by getting caught in the wrong position, getting caught or getting blocked behind, and then you lose time. The stage into Sterling, five laps on a circuit, it's pretty tough in January. So, at Sterling, it's tempting for riders to go too early and then he die in the end. Well then of course we longer hill where the final word will be will be uh, you know final decision will be made then on top of the longer hill. Okay let's talk beer. Oh yeah. German or Australian? Actually my friend you know uh, how um, um, Foster's beer. They do a lot of commercials in Europe and one of their slogans is Foster's means Australian for beer. So when I came here I thought every Australian drinks Foster's and I almost got beat up by asking for Foster's beer. People were almost like kicking me out of the bar. I said, no pal, you can't order <laughs> Foster's beer here. So it's a pale ale or crown lager. I like them. Okay. So you're still involved in, in pro cycling in a large way. Is, yep. Has that been a good way to leave the, the pro ranks? Because uh, when you leave, there's, there's an emptiness in some way, I'm sure, because uh, the competitiveness has been taken away from you a little bit. But now you're still involved with Swift and uh, you still have the opportunity to be involved. Is this something that obviously you're really enjoying? Well, um, of course I like to be involved in the sport and laugh in the sport that gave me so much. But I left everything out there. I have not one competitive cell left in my body. I mean, after 30 years, 33 years of cycling, 18 years as a pro, probably something 60 to 70 crashes, I don't want to suffer anymore, at least for one or two years, until, you know, yeah. it gets me yeah. back. I want to slow down a little bit, so I can breathe a little easier. I think I was down like four watts per kilo, going down to, well, I guess two watts per kilo. <laughs> it's been an easy transition then. Uh, the yes. citizen, the citizen. Okay, so we're actually here riding for Zwift, we're, and we're on a virtual gr uh, group ride. How realistic does it feel? Well, since you have a smart home trainer, it is actually fairly rea uh, pretty realistic. If I sit behind the rider, my home trainer reduces the resistance. So I feel the drag, I feel the, the slipstream. 
if it goes up on the TV screen, my home trainer raises the resistance, so it also it's harder to pedal. If it's go if it goes downhill on the screen, I can also freewheel. So the the home trainer is connected to the computer and to the TV. So what I see on the screen happens on my home trainer. It's a pretty smart system. And through that, you ac can actually ride with anyone around the world in their lounge room. They're actually riding with Jens. Um, yes, I just saw, I mean, if you look at the flags behind the names who are joining us tonight or today, it's the US and Canada, it's people from Korea, from Japan, and for one short moment I saw a flag from South Africa. So we are connecting three continents here, America, Africa and Asia. That's pretty unique. Pretty cool. Yeah, oh, you can yeah. see that again. Uh, and we have uh, 480 riders right riding on. just now. You see that number there? Right 47, on. 480 riders. Hammer time. That's pretty cool. I think, though, that uh, just going for a ride with Jens is, is probably a big uh, big attraction. And you do this quite often, don't you? You actually get on the on the trainer and, and you ride with, the, ride with the group. Yes, absolutely. Um, also, now at home we still have winter. It's cold, it gets dark really early. So being on Swift is so much more comfortable than go out there in the snow and rain and risk of crashing. Please people look to the left that wheel. My <laughs> kid just laughed that moment. Every time I go on Swift I gotta call the kids. Hey kids, daddy's passing the wheel. That's pretty cool. They, yeah, they all come running down to see me passing the wheel. And they look, oh look at the dolphins on the right. Kids love it. So you would have seen from the start of your career to now a huge shift in the way that people actually train, the way that coaching takes place, the way the different messages come through, the new information that's now available. And Zwift is obviously the latest process of that. How, how good would have Zwift been at the start of your career? Well, I probably would have won the Tour de France if I would have <laughs> Zwift at the start. Um, but it's, it's so true what you say. When I started cycling, well, professional, um, you basically said, hey, any hard training is good training. And now, hard training is not good enough. It's not smart enough. You gotta train hard, but in the right way. There's so much more science and knowledge out there now um, to control your training, control your efforts. And it makes, uh, makes cycling more exciting, more thrilling, because the general level of each rider is pretty high. You know, um, in the early 80s, Ben I know he attacked 80 kilometers to go, 80, 80, 80 kilometers to go in Liege past 20 age and he won it with 11 minutes. If now, let's take the strongest possible rider. Let's say Nibali or Philip Gilbert or Chris Froome attacks alone at 80 kilometers to go. People just laughing. They go, he's gonna die. I don't even need to accelerate. We're just gonna catch him. So the, the general level of each rider is so much higher that people just don't win races anymore for 10 minutes at once. It's 10 seconds. You know, when to the France, my first tour, they told me the general rule is place 10 is 30 minutes behind the winner. Nowadays, if you 10th place, you're four and a half minutes behind. You know, with half an hour behind, you finish 40 years. So everybody is so much more fit because of just smarter training. So uh, the, the aspect of you would have seen uh, Bobridge's ride at the national championships on uh, on the weekend. This was an exceptional ride. This was one out of the box and this doesn't happen all that often. So in his aspect of what he was doing is almost taking him back to the, to the good old days of racing when uh, you know, people took almost 10 minutes out of the... I was excited right to see it and follow the stream and see the result in the end. That you went on a daring move and you pulled it off. It doesn't happen anymore. Or it doesn't happen very often anymore. Teams are so good organized and controlled. But you just underestimated Jack and you pulled it off. What what is the, right the point? The, the the very thing that you like about Swift? What what is that that you can actually say, well right this is what on. Swift will do for me? Right as on! A tool. Right on! You have as a training tool now. Okay. We have perfectly controlled positions. We know exactly the climb is going to be have this agreements. The wind is non-existing, is not a factor here. So you can repeat the same effort day after day, week after week, exactly the same conditions. So if you measure 
We have uh, maybe two or three, maybe even four contenders. How do you think it's going to, if everyone stays healthy, how do you think it's going to pan out? Well, that's just my private opinion. So please don't hold me responsible. <laughs> because I'm, I'm going down to the betting agency right after I talk to you, okay? I think we, we can slowly start to count out Alberto Pontador for the win. He's a great rider, but after what, he got like 10 wins in the Vuelta, Giro and the Tour de France. I think he he's maybe just not hungry enough anymore. You know, he's still gonna be a great rider. 
that he might finish second, third or fourth. But for the win, I'm not sure. So it's Nibali and Froome between them two, I think. For Quintana, it would have been last year or never. Because last year we only had very, very short time trial and the team time trial. So if there was ever a tour, Questions about Quintana. Obviously, last year he, did, uh, he waited too long yeah, on uh, on Alpe d'Huez, and then and then do you think he actually could have attacked earlier? Maybe not LPS, but the days before. I mean, a, a rider like uh, Quintana. I also said the same to the Schleck brothers. I said, people, every normal stage, we arrive at the same time as Froome, or back then it was Billy Wiggins. It's a lost day for us. Every day we arrive together with them. It's a minus for us. Because we are standing at the start of the Tour de France. Quintana or Andy or Frank Schleck. With minus five minutes. Because they're not good in time trial. You got to keep in mind. At two minutes zero we have a five minute deficit. So if you want to win the Tour de France. You got to go into the last time trial. With at least two or three minutes at once. And you're gonna make it up somewhere. It's unfortunately not enough to win a stage and win 20 seconds. You need minutes to better time trial that. Richie Port, uh, he hasn't put three weeks together yet, and I think that's a lot of people's concern. But having said that, he's also spent a lot of time on the front uh, for Sky. And riding for Sky is obviously a, a large obligation with regard to his teammates that he's actually had. Do you think he can put three weeks together being a designated bike rider? Well, maybe a little biased because Richie, uh, I'm also his teammate in his first, first year professional. So I like him a lot. I really love him. So I go, hell yeah, he can, of course. Just give him a chance to like not work, not waste his energy. And then I'm fairly sure he can pull it off. I mean, he did finish once uh, second in Giro Italia when he had all the freedom for himself, so why not? We have a, a few uh, very good time trialers now coming through as well. We have Jack Bobridge uh, now riding for Trek. Uh, he obviously has obligations with the, the Olympic team this year, which may affect him in some way, but surely he's an opportunity also for the prologue and some other, some other racing. Definitely looks like Jack is on a good way to have like a yeah, almost spectacular comeback um, after a mixed season last year maybe but this year with winning the, the national championships in impressive style yes he is a he's a good um, a good a good uh, um, how you say um, or oh, he makes the team stronger he makes the team better and stronger by buying him as a rider but they already agreed that he maybe after the tour he gets his freedom to prepare for Sydney or even before the tour. So maybe he's not in the tour because he got to go back to the track program with the Australian national team to get ready for Olympics. But there's a fair chance he wins a medal or maybe two. Do you see a different Jack Bobridge this year compared with maybe where he's been in the past? The more focused, the more committed Jack Bobridge? Definitely, I would say so. Uh, I think a large part of it is he's just grown up. He's a father now, he has a bit of responsibility and objectives in life maybe has changed. You know, he's maybe less interested in party and having good times, but being home as a family and his child. So that helps him grow up and helps him to know, okay, the better I perform, the better of a life I can provide for my children. So maybe he's more focused. The potential was always there, the talent, the raw talent, the potential was always there. So this year we have some Australians actually uh, vying for a possibility of, of wearing the yellow. Obviously Rowan Dennis with, uh, with the prologue, uh, Richie Port uh, we, and, uh, and a few others. Uh, we, Australia has certainly stepped up in that area, but we've actually had a lot of yellow jerseys in the past that you've been part of. Uh, uh, I think it's eight, eight Australians yeah. in yellow. Yeah. Uh, right on! Obviously with the new bunch coming through, it looks very good for Australia. 
Well, definitely a dust. Right, right on. Only you have people who could win the polo. Like right Rachel, on. And, uh, Ruan Dennis. Uh, you got this right Keller Evans, up and coming top sprinter. Right on. You got um, uh, Michael Matthews. Uh, nice. You got him. He's like an established moment. He is at the top of his career. So you also have people there right who are on. pretty talented in sprinting. So Australia looks pretty good in all domains. Right on. So let's talk about, uh, you've mentioned Ewan, uh, let's talk about the green jersey. Uh, I think, I'm not sure that Ewan will ride the tour this year. Uh, maybe it's a little bit too early. Uh, but we still have maybe Matthews who's targeting the green. But then we have Cavendish who needs to probably get back to his former glory. We have Kittle who never didn't, who had a bad year last year. Uh, how do you see the green jersey going this year? Well, that's easy. Peter Sagan. As long as Peter Sagan rides the bike, he will win the green jersey. With double the points of second place. Or they make the green jersey that a sprint winner of flat stage gets 100 points. But Peter Sagan makes so many points on the intermediate sprints, on the medium hard and the harder mountain stages. The sprinters just can't compete with Peter Sagan. Peter Sagan is just a multi-purpose weapon and it's just not stopping. You see Sagan is the best all-round cyclist at the moment, but he's at, when you say all-round, he's at, actually at the top of a lot of the categories, isn't he? Oh yeah, he is. Absolutely he is. I mean, he's world champion. Um, green jersey in the Tour, winning the overrun in the Tour of, uh, in, in the tour of California. So maybe apart from winning the Tour de France, there's not much he couldn't do. Do you think that uh, right there's always on. pressure on the world champion to perform? I, I think that Sagan could be the, wor the first right complete on. cyclist to actually turn the fortunes right of the world uh, championship jersey around. Right on. Well, I believe that uh, Tor Hushoff was a pretty good right world champion. On. I think he won two stages in the Tour of France that year in the, in the world champion jersey. But yeah, right Peter is going to win easy another 10 races. Peter just doesn't feel pressure. Pressure doesn't exist. Pressure gets afraid of Peter Sagan and runs away. You know, Peter Sagan is a legend. I like him as a character as well as a human. Uh, I think this probably the, the aspect that he's still learning how to race as well is, is something that's actually going to be, he'll add to his, uh, his weapons. Right on. Well, I mean, he's a pretty complete rider already by now. And don't forget, he's what, 25, 26 now? So he's just out of the young professional category and already has, I don't know, 50 wins. So, there's a long and yeah, spectacular career ahead of him. And why not winning World Championships another time? Maybe not this year, but maybe in 10 years or maybe two years. So, yeah, Peter's always good to watch. We, we talk about personalities in, in the sport of cycling, and obviously Sagan is one of those at the top of the list with regard to personalities. Jens Voigt was another personality within the sport. Do, do you think that we actually miss we are missing a few personalities? Well, I must say, I'm happy that I had my time and that I'm out now. Because the way hiking is, technology gets in there, but it's less space for being spontaneous. There's less space for racing on guts. It's all controlled. The director tells you, um, yet, I know you can do whatever, 475 watts, for 33 and a half minutes, go now. And then they go, okay, uh, Jack Bobridge, you can do 450 watts for 40 minutes, go now. And that's how races are done. It's maybe less exciting, but just the way it is. With technology helping everybody to control, to know exactly what's going on. And people like me, they go, ah, the sun is shining. I'm gonna go on the tech now. There's no space anymore for us. So you gotta be a soldier. Go, oh, yes, sir, I follow your orders. And just having your own ideas, there's less and less space for that. Because each race is super important for points, for results, for media exposure. It's less space for doing crazy tactics or going on a daring or maybe a suicide move. So I'm, I'm actually good that I'm out because they don't need many people like me anymore. The, the aspect of when you say, uh, I think we always need people like you, Jens. I think that uh, you know, the, the personality, the flavor of the sport comes from people like you. Thanks for the kind words. So, I mean, there, there's enough 
Ah, Jens Ferry Bumi, desperate question from the crowd. Um, well, right on. most of my career together with Bobby Julik, because we were so different. Um, Bobby was really organized. He would fold his jerseys the night before, put on a number the night before, and I would do nothing but reading books or playing Game Boy. Back in the days with Bobby, I was really into playing Pokemon on Game Boy. My kids got me into that. So I was just catching Pokemons, and Bobby was reading about the race, about the mountains the next day, preparing stuff. And then when a mechanic comes in and said, hey Jens, tomorrow LPS, which gears do you want on your bike? And I went, well, what's Bobby doing? They said, oh, Bobby Julik is doing 39, 23. I said, well, I do the same. So Bobby was always well prepared. I was never. But then in the morning, Bobby was really relaxed. And I was just stressing around, packing my suitcase, putting numbers on, jumping on my suitcase to close it, because it was too full. And Bobby was just laughing at me. Like I was just sweating like crazy, running to the team bus, jumping the team bus like last second before they go. And Bobby would be there all prepared already five minutes before. So we were a good couple together. Bobby Julik, favorite roommate. What was the best result that no one ever noticed of yours? Best result? <laughs> Obviously well, a few. I, <laughs> I, I won a Tour de Poitou to Charon twice. Nobody has ever heard of it. It's a race in France, a one week stage race, or five days. Uh, two weeks or three weeks after Tour de France, I won it twice. And apart from hardcore fans, nobody ever knows. But hey, it's a week of racing. We still gotta win it. So maybe that's one of them. Your favorite bike race? Probably the Critique International. I you know I won it five times, tying the record with Bernard Tiveney. Um, I did meet some really good riders there. So. Yeah, Critique International. Favorite climb? Oh, really, I hated them all. But I liked LPS because it was always the last time you know it's on finish on top. And there's like a million spectators, which is awesome to go up there. I hated the most the Kohler Medellin. Because most years when we arrived at Kohler Medellin from the steep side, it doesn't slow down or it doesn't go down like for a split second and by the time we arrived in the Tour de France it would be so hot the sun would be just vertically above you and you felt like it's 80 degrees out there the sun is just burning your back sweating like crazy and it's just a hard steep climb and I always get my head kicked in there so cool nice. the worst the proudest moment of your career proudest moment maybe our record yeah, because, I mean, I was 43, you know, it was the day after my birthday, so I was 43 years old. It was my last event ever. Nobody has done the hour record for like 10 or 11 years. I was fairly convinced I'm going to make it, but there was no security, there was no guarantee. My parents were there, then Eurosport decided to show it live, and I'm not sure if it's true, but Eurosport told me, together with the internet live stream, they had a hundred million viewers. I don't think it's true because... Oh, I was you know, one, I was one. I that's was one that's a su <laughs> Super Bowl level. A hundred million Formula One is a hundred yeah. million. But we had a lot of people, so I knew the pressure. And you don't want to fail in front of a million people. So there was a certain pressure and I was pretty proud that I could stop my career with something like that. Tell me what you went through that day. Tell me the emotion, the the process of the day, you know, like the first 15 minutes compared to the last 15 minutes. It, it, it's, the, the, it's so emotional roller coaster, psychological uh, demanding. Well, we trained for months for it. Get used to the position, find the best position. Um, right lots of on! Lots at intervals. I, I didn't train much or many hours anymore. Right but on! But just really smashing myself. Right on! Day, just to get the body to work hard for this one hour to get the body ready. Uh, um, um, and then in the morning, I actually had to send my dad out of my room. So, Dad, I think I can make it, but Dad, you make me nervous. Just, Dad, go and take a walk. Uh, I need some peace. 
In the first five minutes, since I was so ready and excited, I, right I couldn't on. Even pedals for the first five minutes. I'm like, oh, this is easy, this is easy. And then after 50 minutes, right I go, on. that was just a quarter. And then after half an hour, it hit me. Okay, this was the easy half an hour. Now the same again, but just getting harder and harder and more painful. And then for the last right five on. to eight minutes, you don't have much memory. You just remember pain in your shoulders, in your neck, in your elbows, in your feet, or your butt, your glutes, your back, everything was just hurting and burning. Your heart was beating like it's wanna burst out of your chest. And if I look back at it, if I would have had a puncture in the last whatever two or three minutes and I would have missed it, I don't think I would have ever gone again. I was so hard, I went so deep that I said, nah, I don't want to go there again. What about the psychology? For the last five minutes, you know that you're, you, you, if you can maintain this, that you're actually going to do the record. Jens Voigt's name will be as an hour record holder. And you have five minutes to go. And you know that, as you suggested, everything is hurting, everything is burning, everything wants to stop. What was that like? I, was, I mean, I was getting optimistic, like, okay, I got it. I'm, I'm like two or three laps ahead of the record. It should be fairly safe. But I was still focusing until the last moment, like, okay, don't mess it up, don't mess it up, you know, don't crash yourself. Don't stop breathing, like breathe in a normal rhythm, you know. And don't go too fast, don't change the rhythm. I was really focusing to really make it happen until the last moment, basically. But yes, it was a great feeling. And, and the moment the, cl the clock struck one hour, what was the emotion then? It was the whole, the whole range of emotions. I was relieved that I'm now never gonna suffer again like that. No more stress. No more saying no to a beer or to a steak or to, to a sausage. Like, yeah, I can have a sausage, I can have a chocolate. But and again, again, in the same moment, I realized that's it. I will never ever perform in front of 2,000 people live in the or stadium. 100 million. Or yeah, people watching you on TV. You will never ever have that again. But then later that day, after you know, uh, UCI gave me the, the the trophy, the official certificate for the hour record and TV, and I'd be in my little room, have to take a shower, and then I look at myself in the mirror and go, well, that's it. From now on, you're never ever gonna look like that anymore. Was there a tear? Uh, yeah. And also, like, it was just painful to accept that from that moment on, I'm just getting fatter, slower, and weaker. And it just it hit me in the gut. I'm like, oh, that's it. I'm never gonna look that fit and strong anymore in my life. That was the hardest thing in retirement. To adjust to your body not being that strong anymore. So if you had a moment that you could go back to in your career and relive again, what would it be? Where That's would it be? That's easy. 2004, two of Georgia, two men break away on a hilltop climb. Lance Armstrong and me. I attack Lance, I take 10 seconds, 20, 30 seconds ahead of Lance. Then Lance comes back. And he had just had more, more experience than me. He came back to me and he totally bluffed me. He took a zip off his water and talked to me. And I'm like, oh, he's too good, I'm beaten. And then later I looked at pictures of us and he was about to die on my wheel. But I didn't know. He bluffed me. And even later Lance said, man, you almost had me. So now if I would go back, I would see him coming back. And the second he reached my back wheel, I would go all in, make it or break it. I either win the stage and the tour or I completely explode and I lose two minutes to him. Because I almost had him, but I didn't know. I was young, I was intimidated, man, Lance Armstrong, for Fonks winner. And he talked to me like a bottle in his hand, like, yeah, yeah, it's all good. And I'm like, ah, oh. you know, but I almost had him. I still, it's the only one I regret. We all know how good Lance was at bluffing. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, you're riding a, a Trek Madone now, and it's a beautiful looking bike. What, what is your favorite bike, or what is the best bike that you rode throughout your career? What a question is unfair. <laughs> I'm on a track bike. I mean, I was track people, so there's only one answer left, otherwise I get shot, my friend. No, I mean, I was lucky enough to, to be on good bikes, or mostly good bikes throughout my career. So, but now that the, the latest version of the track Madone 
that's just a piece of art it's like a formula one type of bike and now i really have to say that is like really the, the top of the chain right like on the world basically and there's not many bikes they come close to it it's a beautiful bike plus the way i mean it, it rides smooth great stiffness aerodynamics and then with the red paint job it just looks sexy the bike looks sexy talking to the the local dealer in uh, bicycle express he said as soon as i put him in the window they, they virtually walk out the door yeah that's what he told me i had a little chat with him he said he had it in the window for like 10 minutes a guy walks by turns around goes i'm having that bike who is the uh the rival that you love to hate maybe the rival that you uh when, you, when he got the better of you that you just hated that day I don't want to say it. I don't want to burn somebody. No, I don't think you're burning anybody. I think that you're, you're actually suggesting that uh, I'm actually asking the question about the. There's the obviously respect in that question because you, if you're looking for a bike rider that you didn't want to beat you, but you actually had to respect him because of his ability. Uh, no, I only had one rider I hated nice. him because I just hated him. So that's why I'm not going to say who it is. But if other people beat me, they were just better. I mean, I don't think I ever complained that the rider beat me because he was lucky. No. If somebody beat me, he was better. Point. You know, there's no complaining or ranging around. If you get beaten, you gotta work harder next time. So, I like to beat them all. Let me, let, let, let me put it that way. I like to beat them all because that means I'm gonna win. The, uh, in your early days, you would have had uh, a, a cyclist that you looked up to, that you, you may have had a picture on, on the wall. Who would that have been? Well, since I come from East Germany and they lived behind the wall, or the way they told us it's going right to be lifted on. The wall. You guys were locked out on the bad side of the world. That's how we learned it. Um, there was a rider, Gustav Adolf Schur. They called him Teve Schur. He won twice the World Championships. And then we had the World Championships in East Germany as a three-rider breakaway. Schur again, going for a third title another German teammate and an Italian and the Italian was sure that the German rider wants to win a third title which would have been unheard of and so the German knew that in order to secure a title he sent his unknown teammate out to take the jersey and then he wanted to win for second place but he sacrificed his legend status with three world championships to secure the win for the team and I had this picture on the wall maybe 65, 64 early years and then later I had John Kelly pitch on my wall John Kelly was just as hard as a rock he would be winning the first race he would be winning in the middle of the season and he would be winning the last race he was just hard as nails I loved him being German you obviously would follow other sports as well and maybe soccer was also uh, uh, a sport that you followed who was your favorite soccer team oh that's a painful question <laughs> because um, the team I support, they were East German champions in the last year before the wall came down, okay? Then the country, countries got united and they would take like, whatever, the first six, seven teams of the East German League, the first ten teams of the West German League, mix it to the German League, right? Because they got to bring the two countries together. And then the team had the first match against Bavaria Munich. They won and took the lead. And now they're in a the third league. They're in the third league, they're almost bankrupt. They had a problem with violent fans. Like, there are a lot of fighting in the stadium when he's play. It's hard to love him. But hey, if you're a fan, you go also tr together through the hard times with them. But they make it hard to like him. Third league, man. So now in retirement, uh, you have six kids. So obviously, wherever you go, you need a van to, or a small bus, maybe, to, to cart the family around in. Uh, what do you do now? What's your favorite time with the family now? Um, well, maybe not Christmas because, you know, every Christmas you survive with all the divorce is a success. Man, Christmas is all romantic on the paper and in your imagination, but when it actually comes down to Christmas, so much work to do, so much stress. Um, I like Saturday morning brekkies, the whole family together. We cook up some, you know, some eggs and some uh, pancakes and people come and go and come back and we chat and laugh. But 
I like this moment the best. So, how are we going here on Swift? I notice you're, you're, you're pumping out 180, 190 watts. That's a minute 85. Right on! What's the heart rate doing? Right on! I didn't on. bring a belt, but I can, can tell you. I don't think you need a belt. I think you've done that long ago. Right on! <laughs> I'm squinting like a fat pig. <laughs> so Hammer I'm actually jam. working hard here. But it's good, it's a good workout. Right nice! On. What's, Makes what's the space for the nice. gears to okay. Because remember, a man Hammer is not a camel. So I, I gotta keep drinking. Hammer time! Do you ride much now that you're retired? Right on! Um, with the six kids at home nice. and my wife goes, look, I took all the share of work for the last years. Now that you're retired, you gotta do something with the kids as well. I just don't have that much time anymore to train for five hours. So I do shorter ones, two hours, maximum three. And I do running, because in one hour running, you basically burn as much calories in, like in a two hour bike ride. So it's just more time efficient, so I do more running. I guess you also clean the windows and do the vacuuming now. Yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I also know how to operate the dishwasher. I know where they have the little pads, you know, uh, and I know how to open it, to close it. Those buttons can be tricky to find, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah there's about 20 of them. <laughs> and as an average meal, you go, oh, 20 buttons on the dishwasher. <laughs> What's that for? Right on. Tell me, you obviously started young. Right on. What age did you start? I was nine years old, not even ten, when I started cycling. Right on! Um, and part right of it was... Right on! I was... Right a on! on. ...as a kid. I, I guess... Can't, I can't imagine that now. No, eh? <laughs> I had too much energy. School was fairly easy back then. So I understood it the first time the teacher told us. And then I was bored. And I was talking and distracting other kids. And... So one day the teachers came home to my parents. I said, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Vogt, your kid is a wild kid. He needs to do more sport to burn off this extra energy. Lucky for me, um, back in the days, we didn't have modern words like uh, attention deficit syndrome. So they just said, he's a wild child. Let him do some sport. Nowadays, they would probably diagnose me with like five different mental, de mental defects. I would send me to therapies I, until I actually turned mad. But back then, he said, hey, he's a wild kid. Let him do some sport. So I picked cycling. Trained for three weeks. I won my first race and I was hot. So you won your first race and that was the, the, the feeling you were looking for. You know, the, so maybe this has been missing out of my life. I like this, I might even be good at this. From there it was going, okay, well now I do a little bit more. When's the next race? Is that how it worked out? Uh, yes. Well, and back then, you train two times or three times a week maybe for one hour. That's easy. If you're a 10-year-old boy, you have so much energy, every second day, one hour bike riding, doesn't hurt you. So it was not it was not hard on me. It was just something to do, and I liked it. I could hang out with my friends. I had a whole bunch of friends with me. It was just a great time. Let's talk about uh, food. Uh, meals. As a racing cyclist, obviously, the, the calorific intake well, there was a large calorie intake required. What did you eat before you actually raced? Say you're riding the Tour de France. Let's give an example of a daily routine of the Tour de France. What was, would you eat for breakfast? Well, we always had this fight with the Italians. The Italians always went, hey, pasta, pasta, pasta. I'm like, get away with your stupid pasta. Why don't we have just some simple potatoes? Because pasta is not a natural product. It's an artificial product made of white uh, fl flour. Yes, flour. yes, well. So, a potato is an natural product. I believe it's much more healthy. But the Italians always went, no, we can only have pasta. Oh man, I had so much pasta. So now I actually don't like pasta anymore. My kids like it. So every time they have pasta, they come running at me and laughing at me. Go, daddy, 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 we have pasta. You hate it, don't you? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, 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 but we love it. So we have pasta again. And so it would be in the morning, muesli for breaking and then maybe an hour two hours later nice. uh, pasta oh, nice. nice something you, easy to digest nice. you just finish the stage what what do we eat now uh, finish the stage very important time window is the first 30 minutes after whatever you put into your body in the first 30 minutes has a big effect on your recovery so we had uh, two drinks one was just uh, magnesium minerals vitamins 
and one was a protein recovery shake to help your muscles to recover, to rebuild the damaged uh, muscle cells. So it was like a yeah, liter, two bottles, right in within the first three minutes. And during during the ride, you just you're, you're riding five uh, horse category rides today. What do you eat during the course of the ride? Fortunately, in uh, the teams I have been in, they give us a wide variety to choose from. You could have power gels, you could have bars. They would prepare little pieces of cake wrapped up in some silver foil. Um, you would have like little mini sandwiches, um, some fruits, and bananas. So it was a quite a fair bit of variety. And then, yeah, I tried to have something different. If it's a long and important stage, I would have a big, massive uh, muesli bar, whatever company, a big muesli bar in neutral start. So then I, that would give me enough energy for the first hour of racing goes into the front, the first hour is basically always full gas. And my job was to cover all the brakes. So I didn't have time to eat or drink in the first hour. So I would drink a bottle of, uh, of, of carbohydrates in the neutral zone, plus a full muesli bar, a big one, nice. and then was ready for the first hour full gas. Didn't need to eat or drink anything in the first hour. I, uh, I don't think that we, uh, because of Tour de France, we missed that first hour of racing. I don't think that uh, the public really is aware of what goes on in that first hour and how hard that actually is. Just run us through the first hour of, of, the, of the stage of the Tour de France. Well, uh, since my job always was to attack or go on the brakes, um, I remember one, one time I started, maybe with Bram Tank or Lawrence Sandam. He went, or, or also um, uh, uh, John Degenkolb later. He came to me in the morning and said, hey Jens, are you going to attack today? And I go, hey, that's the best shit in the woods? Of course. <laughs> so now after that's that... That's also very Australian, yeah. Yes. <laughs> after that, he came to me like every start. Hey, there, Jens, how about the bear today? Yes. So he knew when, when he had to go. Um, but basically, the flag drops, and somebody's going full gas. Always, into always. So they should actually cut out the middle part of the TV transmission show the first 30 or 40 minutes, leave out the middle part because nothing happens there, and go straight to the final. It would be much more exciting for the people. Thank you, Jens. I think we've come to the to a conclusion there that uh, has a bit of an insight into to Jens and, uh, and even more importantly, Swift, uh, and how they uh, how you right can interact on. with or actually other participants can interact with you on Swift. It's been a great morning. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thanks right for giving me a chance on. to talk. And thanks for all the people to listen to my stories. Uh, well, you're always entertaining and you have a lot more stories than what we've been able to talk to here. Maybe we can talk for another three hours somewhere else. For sure. The latest, we do the same thing next year, same time, same hour, next year here again. We'll be here. Cool, thanks, awesome. James. Thank you very much. All right. Goodbye, everybody. And thanks for joining us today.